Okay, thank you. And we'll take a, an opportunity for a photo if that's okay. Oh, please. <laughs> we have a report please. back to yeah. that one. Thank you. Thank you. And you're, you're sharing, right? Yes, we are yeah, sharing. Great. Awesome. Uh, we'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us uh, for our presentation. We'd like to thank uh, the organizers of the symposium for the opportunity to share some of the work that we're doing at the School of Veterinary Medicine. This is a cross collaborative project with the College of Education, colleagues from the College of Education. Um, the team that we developed around this work is composed by Dr. Arlene Garcia, specialist in animal and behavior, behavioral welfare. Uh, Dr. Fernando Valle, who is not here today, who's a specialist in educational leadership, a uh, strong voice and advocate for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly around education, teacher, principal, and superintendent development, and uh, colleague Michael De Leon. Um, we share the same grown space a few years ago in the Rio Grande Valley, didn't know each other there. Uh, Michael is pursuing his PhD, actually EDD, Educational Leadership, and he has a strong pursuit of um, multiculturalism, particularly in medical education environments and other higher education settings. Um, he's been around uh, quite a bit, has a lot of experience. His wife is also a faculty member of the College of Education in educational leadership with a uh, special emphasis in policy development and um, principal and superintendent development as well. My name is Marcelo Schmidt and I am an educational psychologist. I work in the School of Veterinary Medicine and um, I help out mostly with curriculum and assessment. One of my responsibilities is to review syllabus so I get close to most of the civil syllabus that are developed in our program. Uh, just very briefly, uh, the syllabus and the work that we are reviewing today um, are related to a course that I'm teaching. I'm privileged to work with this group of people and to share and collaborate, learn with and from them. And um, I'm gonna invite Arlene to kind of carry us over through an introduction and share with us a little bit of the context of what our School of Veterinary Medicine is. So the outline for our presentation is a brief introduction. Arlene's gonna help us out with that. I'll talk about a method that we used for paying attention to our syllabus. So when we say course development, one of the cornerstones of course development is the syllabus. So we're focusing on the syllabus today. Uh, then we'll discuss some of the findings from our discourse analyses and our uh, critical review of the syllabus and just discuss some of our findings and maybe we can make a little, little bit of a open table uh, conversation. So thank you, Arlene, if you'd like to uh, share with us a little bit about the concepts of the school. So good morning, everyone. Um, I am Arlene Garcia, assistant professor at the School of Veterinary Medicine. And so today, just to give you a brief introduction of what the School of Veterinary Medicine is um, and what makes us different, um, I'd like to share just a few details. And so traditional vet schools um, do have a teaching hospital. And so basically the students enroll into veterinary school, the first two years of veterinary school, they actually do all the book work. And it's not actually until third and fourth year that they actually get to get some hands-on exposure when it comes to animals, um, you know, taking basic readings of vital signs and things of that nature. And it's not until fourth year that they actually get to be involved in any type of surgery um, or do any type of actual, um, have any type of physical contact with the animal in a surgery room. So that to Texas Tech, was something that was a bit of a concern because we do not want to develop veterinarians um, that are not ready to start a surgery and go full blown in their career, um, you know, three or four years into, into being a veterinarian, right? We want our veterinarians 
to essentially hit the ground running. So what makes this school different is that, again, we are not a teaching hospital. That means that we don't get referrals from other veterinarians and things of that nature for our students to work on. Um, one, because when these individuals, when these veterinarians refer these animals to a teaching hospital such as Texas A&M, these are actually cases that were not able to be solved by any local veterinarian. And so these students are actually getting exposed to cases that they will not see in real life. Um, and so that was one of, one of the, the most important concerns. The second one again was that they don't have the experience that they need to feel confident in their career when they graduate. And so um, again, it's not a teaching hospital. We don't have a teaching hospital, but what happens is that during third year and fourth year, our students actually get to go out and work with veterinarians in the field. So what is the benefit of this? That these students have the comfort and have um, the experience to actually ask um, veterinarians, you know, the background on the case, what's happening. They get that hands-on experience and they actually get to communicate with the client. So we sometimes don't understand in, in academia and, and as you know, PhDs, veterinarians, that it's not just about loving the animal, it's about being able to communicate, to communicate with people of low economic status, medium, high. Um, and so those are skills that have to be developed with experience. So just in a nutshell, this veterinary school is completely different from any vet school in the nation. And so that's what makes this unique. And it gives opportunity for us to actually assess and evaluate the curriculum and the program to ensure that we're doing the right thing for these students. Um, anyway, that was just a brief introduction and thank you for your time. Thank you, Arlene, appreciate you sharing some of the uh, characteristics of our school. I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper and give you a perspective of some of the other details that are uh, special and unique about the school. Um, these are demographic and other data trends in veterinary medicine. And I think it's important to share this because if we're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, if we're looking at multiculturalism, we can see that the national trends do not necessarily represent the demographics of at least you know the individuals and the, and the population in the state of Texas, and definitely not necessarily the population of higher education in general. Uh, nearly the majority of the students are female in veterinary education. Um, over 80% of them are white in terms of national trends. Uh, less than 10% are Hispanic, Latinx, 25% uh, are first generation, the average age is 23, so in some ways we are very similar. In Texas, most prepared Texas A&M University, that has been the trend. Now that there's an alternative option, we're starting to recruit secure students. I've added a couple of extra details because a lot of people don't know this, but students usually earn at year one about 65 to $70,000. Uh, so it's not the most lucrative profession. Most of them walk out with $300,000 worth of student debt, which is very different from a traditional student, um, more so closely to medical education. What we're doing different at Text Tech is um, we've actually broken a little bit of the trend on the female um, majority. So it's still at about approximately 70%. 75% uh, are white. We right now have 20% of Hispanic Latinx students. Uh, for the next cohort, that's looking more like 24, 25%. So we're actually breaking the barriers there and we're, we're leading the nation in terms of um, recruiting students of color in general, particularly uh, the emphasis has been Hispanic students as a Hispanic serving institution. So we're lined in with the mission of the university. And 50% of our students are first generation. There are two general umbrellas that we operate in our college, and those are a values culture. And there's a multicultural competency um, umbrella as well. And these are things that exist they're not yet completely instituted. So we're working on that, we're developing that, we're figuring it out. Many times we have said that we're crossing the bridge as we build it. And particularly with this, these issues where there's not that much said and written and 
in terms of recommendations of how to do it. We are doing it as a team, we're doing it collaboratively. And this right here is, is kind of what springboards this issue of looking at our classes and looking at our syllabi to ensure that we are addressing issues of multiculturalism and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So a little bit um, closer to the course that we were talking about today. So this is course, the part of a pathway. What we call a pathway is a uh, master's science that will allow students to uh, enter the DBM program. DBM programs are usually very selective, but this master's of science course is a pathway into that program. Um, so we address issues of education and adult education, learning and learner specifically. Uh, they are very small classroom sizes, so they allow for engagement, close collaboration, and close connection relationship with students. So developing the course syllabus, we're focusing on the syllabus because we find that to be the cornerstone and the element and an instrument that sets the tone for the class. A lot of us have been in situations where we pick up a syllabus and two statements in, there's something that says something like, do not contact me after five. Or don't think about extra points because you're not going to get them here. This is a tough class and you will have to hustle to make it through with other professional fancy terminology. But essentially the message is that. And basically what's happening with that, we're, we're creating barriers, we're breaking down relationships, we're not engaging our students, we're engaging in a, a, a colonizing versus decolonizing of our syllabus by creating the hierarchy between us and them versus us together in a learning educational experience. So um, what we did for this particular study, and um, first, obviously, we just want to be the best that we can be. Um, but then we saw an opportunity to look at this more as a formal study and actually engage experts in the field on the review of the syllabus. What we mostly paid attention to was course description, the learning objectives, learning outcomes or assessments which are uh, associated to learning objectives, course content, and other relevant information. The method that we used was we developed the syllabus first before deploying it. Most research around syllabus review is after the course has been developed and deployed. So somebody will come into a program, grab some syllabus, review them and say, well, you don't have this, this, and this. In our case, our course will be deployed next year. So we're ahead of the game. We're paying attention to this early. We're trying to establish a culture. And we hope that then, you know, we start with one course, we can actually spread like wildfire into other courses and make it an institutional practice. We subjected the syllabus to review by a panel of experts, Arlene, Michael, Fernando Valle, and actually myself as a self-reflector. Uh, we looked at um, recommendations by Fuentes, Celaya, and Madsen, who actually have a very comprehensive article on how to review a syllabus, what to pay attention to from a diversity, equity, and inclusion angle. And then we also followed recommendations in terms of discourse analysis by Guy, um, in terms of asking the right questions or asking particular questions about the syllabus that are important to ensure that we have elements, that we have developed uh, significant meaning, that we have developed context, that we have developed um, or we promote relationships with students and that we have you know, minimized potential for stereotypical threats and others. So we had four reviewers, experts in higher education with a DEI lens. We did a little bit of a consensus analysis. So in, in terms of qualitative research and data collection, we could have experienced a very rigid approach where, for example, everybody or every member of the team makes a recommendation after reading a particular section of the syllabus. And then we examine that through consensus analyses. So if Arlene makes a recommendation that there is no statement about diversity on the course description, and Michael identified that as well, and maybe I reflected and found that that was a deficiency on the course description, we could then agree on that and make a recommendation for improving that section. Now, that would be a very formal way of doing it. And actually, I created an instrument around that. But in the end, 
we chose to actually have conversations about this rather than everybody individually working on reviewing the syllabus, writing down their comments and recommendations. We opted for face-to-face -face conversations about particular areas in the syllabus. That still led to recommendations, comments, and notes uh, that helped us improve um, the syllabus content. So uh, we update. Our plan is to update the syllabus based on these recommendations, and then we want to follow up uh, with the development of the course content. So we're on the first stage again, syllabus development, paying attention to multiculturalism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, making sure that we are addressing particular questions and reviewing it from that diversity lens. And um, at this point, these are a couple of things that we found. So. Um, before that, even uh, these are the these. This is the basically what we call a guiding framework for reviewing that syllabus, and we can share this with you. But these are some of the things that we paid attention to: include diversity statement, decolonize the syllabus, make the syllabus family friendly. Uh, in medical education and in education in general, there are individuals who are parents, who are mothers, who are fathers, who have other responsibilities. Uh, we want to recognize that, we want to honor that, we want to make sure that we address issues of concerns of time and so forth. Uh, infuse DEI throughout the document, include DEI learning outcomes, learning specific DEI learning outcomes. And then we ask these questions, are we creating significant meaning uh, for people in context? What identities are we depicting and acting? And does our discourse build foster social relationships? This is some of the things, or these are some of the things that we found. And I'm gonna ask uh, Michael to step up. He actually did a lot of work on this and uh, share a little bit in terms of findings and recommendations. Thank you, Michael. So as uh, part of our study, we uh, applied the Fuentes et al. Um, recommendations that were, that were specifically commented on and recommended on and applied it to the course in the veterinary science medicine that we're looking at the course title is learning and the learner contemporary issues in veterinary medical education. So as a group, we started looking then at the course description, the one of the, the three, three areas that we looked at the first one being the course description. We did identify then uh, what are, how do we take a diversity center approach and on what aspects of EDI do we find that are most important to students and their learning and how do we make that uh, a part of this, the course description. So part of our analysis then is also then looking at the syllabus and we encourage you as you are contemplating your own syllabus. So look at the syllabus from the DEI lens. We use the EDI term here, the EDI lens, and ask yourself, okay, if you, as you're reading it, does the instructor acknowledge that diversity discussions will be part of the inclusive class? So if you take that stance first and you Put yourself in that in that aspect or that space and say, okay, let me let me read some statements from my course description and see if I'm creating this environment. So I took one of the sentences that are in the particular syllabus that we were studying um, and analyzing. So students in this course will learn best practices and strategies to enhance learning environments while gaining a keen awareness of learning behaviors of veterinary medical students. So we are acknowledging there's a, a lot of uh, components to this. Um, description. Uh, a lot of times your descriptions are handed to you because maybe a, ta a class is taught beforehand. And so now applying the DEI lens and kind of looking at the, at the description and kind of being, as we do use the term, a lot of the times are very vanilla because they want to apply uh, to so many situations and so many different students. But if we don't talk about diversity, we're not including diversity. So we instead said, let's consider it from a D uh, EDI angle and say, okay, as a class, uh, we will engage, uh, we're now talking about, uh, we're, we're decolonizing, we're taking the hierarchy uh, away, and we're, as a professor, as a teacher, or TA, however you're organizing your class, it's a we. We, we, we. So the students reading this see that as a collaborative effort now. We will engage in discussing contemporary learning theories and how these practices advance or deter the learning behaviors of fellow veterinary medical students of different ethnic cultural groups. So we've already infused DEI language into this, where we're saying at the outset, we together are going to work, and we're not just going to talk about how they, how the good things about how thing, uh, how theories work. We're also going to talk about maybe the other side, the un, the untold stories, and your lens is going to be part of that conversation because I may not see things the way you do, 
right? And if we, and if we go in this together, we're going to learn things collaboratively. And hopefully, as veterinary students, we advance because we're seeing things from different perspectives. So in your course description, it's important then to look at the language that's being used and infuse DEI, but make it purposeful. And, and that's, I think, our discussion as part of the course description is to is to make, be mindful of using EDI language as part of it and, and start it from the outset. The next section we looked at was learning outcomes and objectives. And again, um, part of this is also how are you going to assess students throughout the course? And that's, so you want to, as part of the syllabus, we want to project the way we're going to do this and be very mindful about, okay, we're going to put this out uh, early so that students understand what's expected of them, but also what they understand what's expected of me at the same time. So in this learning outcomes, um, this was particularly set up as a focus of there's a course objective and how I'm going to assess it. So all classes or all, all uh, different methodology or different, different uh, areas will have a different focus. In this particular case, the focus was evaluate the efficacy of adequate and various contemporary approaches to teaching. Okay? We also had creating different uh, or learning activities that promote critical thinking, independent and collaborative learning environments. So these are great terms and it does talk about how or what the objective of the professor in this class is what they want to get out, uh, students to get out of it. But as we were looking at this a little bit more, uh, with the DEI lens and being more mindful or being more intentional about it, we, we thought we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to include at the outset, and this is something for you to consider as you're constructing your syllabuses, is just put the statement out there. As part of continually assessing our learning throughout the semester, it will be important to adopt and consider a multicultural perspective when designing your research projects and preparing your case discussions. So why is that important? Because at the outset, you're saying, as you're preparing your class discussions or presentations you're doing to class, or as you're doing your research and getting further into the objectives we're talking about and the validating the efficacy and adequacy of, of teaching, do so with a purposeful set of mindset of saying, okay, how is this gonna to apply to students who aren't like me? How is it gonna to apply to uh, a, a patient of a of an animal who's not like me. Now, if we take it to the uh, to other extremes. How am I going to interact with with people? And a lot of this is all communication. How am I going to take their perspective before I present maybe some really bad news? Right, it, it, as I'm part of uh, communicating with with a with another patient or with a parent or with whatever the situation might be. You take yourself out of the situation, and you're you're already we're teaching students or we're helping students understand that we're evaluating them with the DEI perspective. And we're asking them to start presenting this as well. And so along as part of the course, they're not, we're not just teaching or, or expecting them, or I guess I, as a professor, I'm not telling them what to do, but I'm also helping them and encouraging to do that on their own as part of their presentations as well. So then lastly, the last part we looked at was uh, in the syllabus was course content. Um, and one of the things we looked at, and, and depending on, on your course content, a lot of times it's meant to communicate how your course is going to progress through the semester or through, and, and what are the things, specific topics and subtopics you're going to focus on. Well, as part of the research and the, and the, the recommendations, considerations we applied to this particular uh, syllabus, we looked at basically not only taking the viewpoints that are very popular in my, in my, in my area, my study area, but also look at opposing areas. Maybe you look at some of the writers, some of the research that aren't popular in this, in the sense of the same, but taking a different viewpoint and then asking students to analyze a little bit more about that viewpoint. And why, why do we consider that to be not the popular theory, but maybe a theory at this point? And then talk about how adopting some of those things might make the future of this profession a little bit different. And so it's a very, purposeful intention of saying let's look at let's look at data and research out there but not only through the most popular lens but through a couple of different lenses and there we start looking at different points of view and encouraging our students to adopt that perspective as well in their own research students don't always learn in the same way and so acknowledging from a for dei lens and from a, um, a a teaching perspective try doing things like a flip classroom where you engage students you do the information that's presented beforehand so that the lecture itself is more engaging. And how do the things apply? Not just, am I just regurgitating what was expected, expected out of that particular lecture? Um, 
PBL or problem-based learning, simulation-based learning. Uh, again, kind of putting things out there for students to then discuss and bring into the classroom. And those kind of, uh, those kind of uh, uh, methods we feel are more engaging and bringing out different perspectives and viewpoints from the students themselves. And this is all in, in versus or in comparison to putting out a standardized test or putting out a multiple choice test, where a lot of times they'll just assess very basic things. And sometimes those tests aren't written to assess every kind of person the same way. So in this perspective, we, uh, we ask you to evaluate your course content from there. So we also understand there are challenges and barriers. Um, we looked at different areas that are that can be institutional, they can be societal, or at in within your profession, professional level uh, barriers to to creating or instituting an area. Of looking at your syllabus, one of the one of the key things also is: Am I the only one doing this? Am I am I the early adopter? Am I the only one talking in the room that's that's trying to be more mindful about making my syllabus more DEI uh, focused? You might be, you know. And so what we talked about is be that guy that be that person that rings that bell early and keep ringing it because it's as you infuse your your syllabus um, with this data and this with this uh, perspective more people will adopt it and when these students as they become teachers as they become professors they're also going to start adopting some of these uh, key characteristics as well so one of the so by incorporating our inclusive language we ask that you adopt a longitudinal perspective so Create a course and follow it through your course, but also from year one, if you create a project from year one, find out how year two and three and four, the student can carry that through that uh, and, and tie back to some of those uh, perspectives and learning uh, within DEI that they, they can apply for as they grow in their own academic, but also then apply some of these perspectives to that as well. And I'll put that back to you. Um, some of the other perspectives that we're talking about. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. In closing, um, we definitely said things in our syllabus. In a conversation that I had with Arlene yesterday, she says, this looks like, like, like a class that I have to take, not a class that I want to take. And so, um, in other words, but essentially that was a message. Uh, we said things in the syllabus. But um, we want to pay attention to also being things and doing things. And the things that we want to be is advocates, champions, supporters. And the things that we want to do is build relationships, minimize barriers, encourage students, and uh, learn collaboratively. Thank you very much. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you for your recommendations. And um, that's our presentation. Okay, I think we'll we'll save the main discussion uh, for the end of the presentations because there might be some nice ways to to connect them. But um, Cam, do you have a, a a question you'd like to ask of of that specific group, perhaps? Uh, no, sir. I can wait until the end. I don't hear him here. Sorry, dude. You're you're muted and I'm not sure how to unmute you. Could you chat? Sorry, I saw that you said something, but we seem to still be muted in this room. Okay, well, um, please place something in chat if you have a, a question. Oh, okay, it says wait till the end, no worries, the chat works, will do. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> it's my pleasure to now uh, turn the podium uh, over to Javier uh, Morales, who, as I mentioned earlier, is an MA student uh, in our uh, program here in media and communication, and uh, also an assistant, part of the team at, uh, 
at the Harris Institute. I think you probably received communications from him, <laughs> replied to his. So you, I guess you already know him in that sense, um, those of you who are, are presenters. So I'll turn it over to Javier. Yeah, thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Javier Morales, like Dr. Wilkinson said. I'm a master's student. I did my undergraduate on science communication and specifically on environmental sciences. And I came here to study communication because I wanted to become like a science communication scholar. So in, in my undergraduate, I did it on Mexico City and I was working there studying the air pollution in Mexico City. And I did the documentary about Mexico City air pollution problem. Um, when I came here, I wanted, I wanted to also address a problem of this area. Well, it's a natural problem, but it is a problem because we can, you will see that. And I wanted to talk about dust storms. I wanted to study dust storms that are very common in this region. And of course, since I'm doing a master in communication, I want to study how to communicate about this issue here in Lubbock and the region of West Texas. So this is my presentation, the risk communication of dust storms in Lubbock. And I'm also going to show you in the middle of the presentation, a, a video that I made that is like an effort to start doing some kind of materials to communicate about this. Are you sharing your screen? I'm not sure. <laughs> Where is it? Okay, here it is. Well, let me share everything just in case. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. So First, I want to talk what those terms are because I want to make clear what, why it is important to communicate about them to the people. So those terms are meteorological events, phenomena that are characterized by the increasing of dust particles in the air. They are mainly caused, there are two ways that the dust storms can form. One is because of strong winds and we have a strong winds around here almost throughout the year. And also another cause for dust storms are um, strong or severe storms, weather, strong weathers, strong, weather, uh, strong storms. <laughs> and these are two ways for a dust storm to be formed. And the consequences of dust storms are that they can low the visibility, decrease the visibility, and also decrease the air quality in the area. So Lubbock has a long history of dust storms. In fact, uh, this was the area where the dust bowl happened. This, this was one of the most impacted areas in the United States. And why? Because the, there are geographic factors like this is a arid or semi-arid uh, region. And we have a strong winds. These are the plains. So the winds run really fast and really strong. And that's why we have a lot of dust storms here because of the arid weather, arid uh, factors and uh, strong winds. Then what are the, the dust storms effect? First, the dust storms can impact the agriculture industry because they it can damage the crops. Also, it affects transportation, like I said, because the decrease in visibility, it makes really hard to drive and it can cause a lot of traffic accidents. And most important well, for me, and I want to talk about this and focus on this, is the health effects that these dust storms have, the dust, the dust particles. And breathing these particles can be really harmful to the health. And that's what, what I'm going to talk about that right now. So the vulnerable, vulnerable populations for breathing dust particles are mainly children, senior adults and people with pre-existing conditions. 
like asthma, for example. So, um, of course, the EPA has said that breathing these particles can put vulnerable population at risk. So the main effects, we have two types of effects, the short-term effects and long-term effects. The short-term effects are coughing, sneezing, running nose, eyes irritation. Probably you have felt some of these because in fact, uh, these last weeks we have had some dust storms around here. In fact, I'm going to talk that later, but we have two types of dust storms. One that are the big ones with the wall of dust moving and others that is just like the increasing of dust particles in the air. Well, we are going to talk that later. Then the long-term effects are can be cancer or um, myocardial infarction or strokes and others. So some studies have found that after a dust storm, there are an increase on ER visits because of respiratory conditions. So yeah, it can impact the people, especially vulnerable population immediately, almost immediately, one or two days after a dust storm. So who warned us about this? Because sometimes we don't hear a lot about this problem of breathing dust storm particles. So the organization in charge of warning us about meteorological phenomena is the National Weather Service. In fact, the National Weather Service has these warnings and advisories about when there is a dust storm. But as you can see here, all these warnings are not related with the health impact that dust storms have. They are all related with the decrease in the visibility. So there are not, inf not no information about what are the impacts or the effects of these dust storm particles. And also people cannot take precautions because they don't know that it can be harmful for them. And they, there are no recommendations for, for, for them from these organizations. Also, you can see here, there is, this is like a warning, a typical warning from the National Weather Service. And as you can see right here, there are only recommendations for driving during a dust storm. There is nothing said about not breathing. Well, you cannot not breathe, but you can like decrease your exposure to that. Like man, keeping, well, not going out or staying at home. Also, the city of Lubbock has this in his website, has this disaster awareness page, and they have this, all these disasters that they list here. And there are no, no mentions of dust storms in here. So it's also like they are, um, well, they are not paying attention to, to this problem. Also for this, well, I'm working on this and I did like this quick research in the news about how they treat dust storms when dust storms happen. And I found that only one out of 20 news about dust storms mentioned the health effects. So they are usually just replicate what the weather service says. So there is no information about this. And because of that, I wanted to create like, or start to create or doing an effort to inform about this to the population. And that's why I create this video. It's just a small, a short video of five minutes and I want to show it to you. Can you I? Let, uh, Rosa in before you do the video. Oh yeah, sure. Perfect. So can I go to YouTube here?
Hola, mi nombre es Javier. So you can call me Javi. I was born in Cuba. Cuba is a beautiful Caribbean island, full of fantastic beaches that I love. In fact, I have a tattoo of a beach. Well, that was a mistake. The thing is that I now live in West Texas, specifically in Lubbock. I like it here. It is peaceful, quiet. I am doing a master's degree here. And I live next to this huge park. Yeah, it's a huge lake too. It is not a beach, but yeah, close enough. To be honest, I am not a good swimmer. In fact, when I go to the beach, most of the time I'm just lying on the sand listening to music. I miss those moments, but I don't miss the sand because Lubbock has a lot of the rock. But the sand is not on the ground, it's in the air. That's just a piece of water. It's a huge cloud of dust during the day into the night. One day, when I was on my way to the university, a big cloud of dust and sand came to cover the city. The wind was strong. And I could feel the dust particles in my eyes, in my mouth, hitting my face. I was scared. I didn't know what was happening. It was like anything I'd seen before. So I saw shelter inside the building. A girl there told me, don't worry, it's just a dust storm. <laughs> a dust storm? A storm made of dust? That same day when I got home, I started to do some research. I learned that there is a long history of dust storms in Lubbock, and a researcher at my university knows everything about it. So I contacted her. Hello, Dr. Dreyer. My name is Javier Morales, and I want to kindly ask you to help me answer some questions. She told me that there was something very important I should know about dust storms, and invited me to visit her lab. A dust storm is a meteorological phenomenon where we have increase of uh, particles in the air. Generally, we know that when there's not enough rain, there's a high chance of uh, dust because the ground is dry. But we found that for this region uh, of West Texas, many dust events happening after rain. So if it rains, dust. If it doesn't, dust. So should we be worried about it? So dust storms have an ability to impact us in different ways. For one, because the visibility reduced, when you're driving, you have a higher chance for a car accident. So for example, you need to get off the road and turn off your light and just wait until the visibility is good. So that's one issue. There's also an economic impact. In different places around the world, they have to shut down airports. They have to shut down different factories because of dust events. Uh, it's been known that dust impacts pregnant women. And the biggest problem is impact you when you breathe these particles. So there's a lot of work showing that there's health complications with breathing and being exposed to uh, dust particles. We're now doing another set of experiments, which is basically taking these dust particles and exposing them to human lung cells. And we're looking at what the interaction between the dust and the cells. So we are trying to understand what health implication being exposed to a specific dust event could be. So what can we do to avoid getting sick because of a dust storm? The best thing you can do to avoid getting sick because of a dust storm, stay home. Stay indoor until the dust storm passes. If you have to be outside, wear a mask. Dust storms can be frightening, rare, but also a spectacular and exciting phenomenon. But like everything in nature, we should not underestimate their power. That's why we should always take precaution. Stay safe. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, I made that. When you think of public art. You might think oh, sorry. of a local library, a sculpture.
I made that video for a class here. And um, yeah, I think that is a good example of how we can communicate about this problem. Of course, this video is made for to be on a specific platform, specifically in, in media, in, in social media, because of the format of the video. And well, that's a way to start communicating about this. Um, of course, when I did this video, I was thinking I, I had this theoretical frame that, for example, for example, no, I was basing all this, all the information I gave was based on these two models. The first one is the precaution adoption process model. This model show has seven stages and it goes from an unaware population of an issue. Well, the population that is unaware of an issue for, for, to an, an, a population that maintains a behavior to take precautions from that issue. That's a precaution adoption process. The other one is the health belief model that presents two major concepts that are susceptibility and severity. Um, I wanted to impact those two concepts with my video. So these are the models. And here you can see, how can I hide this? <laughs> Okay, perfect. Yeah, so this is the precaution adoption model. So it goes from unaware of an issue to maintenance and it goes through on it, on engaged with by the issue, decided to act, acting, etc. And then the health belief model that has these two major concepts that I wanted to impact. It also has these other concepts, but I think if we want to create a communication product to, to have an impact on these variables here, uh, we want we have to create a different video, for example, uh, talking about other things. So let's let's see that. So like the like the model of the precaution adoption model, it, this is the first stage, the raising the awareness, because we are assuming that the population is unaware of the issue. Um, for that, I wanted to I wanted to have an impact on these two concepts. Like I said, susceptibility. Susceptibility is people's uh, perception of if they of how much they are um, exposed to this issue. And severity is the people's perception of how this issue is going to impact them. How much is going to impact them. So uh, I think I impacted these two concepts when I talked about how the dust storms can, can affect you and also how, um, well, what is the mechanism by that dust storms have to affect you that is reading these particles. And the other one is it can have consequences like um, running nose, et cetera. So I think for the second stage that will be engaging people with this issue, we will have to take other actions. And probably we will have to recommend people to install these weather alerts. So because one of the other, the other major concept is used to action. We need to give people uh, like an alert for them to be able to take precautions. So I will, suggest them to, we will make another video suggesting them to, for example, download one of these applications so they have this alert and they can, and they know when to take uh, precautions. Um, and an important thing that I, I don't have here in my, in my presentation is what I said about, we have two types of dust storms. And the first one is this big wall of dust. And I think people in people's minds, that's the dust storm. That's what they think when, they, when you say dust storm, this wall moving of dust. And, but there are other types of dust storms that are called not dust storms, but dust events. And those are just the rising of the dust particles in the air because mainly because of the strong winds. And 
It is a problem that people don't consider that a dust storm or a dust event because they don't take precaution when one of these happens. For example, I, I was yesterday on a baseball game here at Tech and there were a big dust storm or dust event. So, and it's even more dangerous when you're doing sports or you're doing any exercise because you're breathing hard, harder. So you are breathing more particles. So it can be more harmful for those people. So I think one of the one of the goals we will have to, well, we need to have is telling people that these are also dangerous, that these dust events are, they don't have a big wall or anything that is also harmful and they should take precautions. So I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Or on some? So regarding your, uh, your push for engagement and uh, making more people aware of precautions, you mentioned health effects in, mm -hmm. in that kind of that middle slide, portion of the slide. Um, are there specific diseases related to dust storms or dust, uh, increased dust particles that are in the dirt or in the sand or in the, the, the particles themselves that people should become more aware of? And then how to prevent that? Is it a simple mask mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that does that or are there other precautions? Yeah, yeah. For example, dust storms are harmful because these dust particles are really small and they can penetrate to your lungs and cause several diseases. Like it can cause cancer, it can cause a uh, stroke or other. But also these small particles and others that maybe are a little bit bigger can also have inside them fungi or uh, or bacteria or even viruses. So they can also transport these diseases and if you breed them you can get infected so yeah and um, the precautions people should take is yeah wearing a mask is a good precaution so also staying at home is the best so not getting not exposing yourself to those to the dust and also i wanted to relate this to the symposium's topic that is hispanic and latinx and i wanted to say that a lot of Hispanic population works on fields like construction and agriculture. And in, in, for them, it's it is impossible sometimes to stop working during one of those events. So they are one of the population that are more vulnerable to this issue. And they are being exposed more than other people that maybe can stay home. So yeah, that's why this is relevant for the Hispanic population. Thank you. Is that what's dinging? Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so, well, it tells me I'm I'm screen sharing, so uh, I'll believe the technology. <laughs> That's probably a risky thing to do. Um, thank you all for for attending. Uh, the session and uh, and the colloquium or symposium uh, today, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, we've uh, we started this program uh, seven years ago in order to bring together people who are doing Hispanic Latinx related work on campus uh, in anticipation of HSI. Now that HSI is here, we think it's important to keep the forum open. So we, we hope to continue growing it. And I should mention that besides the Harris Institute, the um, Latino Latino Studies uh, Center is also uh, participating and sponsoring. They haven't been able to have as active a role because there's a dean transition going on in arts and sciences, but you may have read back in November that 
that um, initiative has been approved. We're very excited about that uh, because we've been basically the only Hispanic Latinx oriented, you know, specifically oriented uh, institute or center on campus. And it's really going to sort of, um, you know, bring more resources, more, more talent uh, to bear. I know the directors of that, they're great people. And so we're, we're very pleased uh, that, that, that they're coming, uh, coming on board and, and participating. Um, so this is some work that uh, I conducted along with a couple of colleagues, uh, Edoya Lola, who's in classical and modern languages and literature. She's actually in, in Spain on leave right now. Uh, and Gabriel Dominguez Partida, who did his PhD here, was uh, an assistant director of the Institute, uh, but returned to uh, Guadalajara um, at the beginning of the semester. So he's a, a co-author, still, you know, a, a collaborator, and um, we have a long-standing relationship with uh, the UPE, as we, as we call it. So we'll, you know, we'll be continuing, continuing to to work with him. And as it says at the bottom of the slide, um, this is based on a forthcoming chapter in an edited book, uh, communicative spaces and bilingual context, discourses, synergies, and counterflows in Spanish and English uh, that some colleagues at the uh, University of Arizona are, are working on. And uh, interesting uh, you know, parallel that one of those uh, editors of the book is a communication scholar and the other is more in the area of linguistics as is sort of the composition of, of our, our research team. So um, I had a slide here talking about the Harris Institute. I'll just say very quickly, um, in case any of you aren't that familiar with us, that we focus on uh, teaching research and service related to those two areas, uh, both Hispanic uh, related communication and also international. What I found really attractive about this position and this initiative is that it does bring together uh, those two areas, which is what I've done my work on basically in, in the area of Spanish language media and how the US sector has been connected with other Spanish speaking uh, areas of the world. So it really made sense to me when I when I saw the, the description of, of the Institute and uh, we're, we're very involved in uh, some of the DEI initiatives on campus in this important transition in my view from a primarily white institution to one that's more sort of inclusive and reflective of the demographic uh, in the state. So we actually put quite a bit of our, our extra service time into DEI and HSI related uh, initiatives. Um, I have kind of text heavy uh, slides that I've, I've, I've pulled from, from the paper. So please um, bear with me. But uh, basically what we're looking at is this connection between the way people use language, some of the uh, social attitudes related to language, uh, identity and media use here on the South Plains. One of the things I'm really excited about with this work is that we're very much focusing it on this region, which those of you who have been here for a while or have been in other parts of the bilingual or Spanish speaking world know is quite unique, right? When I first came here, I moved here from San Antonio and I noticed the linguistic dynamics were quite different than what I was used to in South Texas, which was quite different than you know, other places I've lived like um, you know, in Mexico and, and, and Austin, et cetera. So um, what I'm hoping is that this will shed some light on some of the specific uh, linguistic and media dynamics here in this region as a relatively small television market, right? number 147 out of about 220. So, you know, relatively small, uh, which is important in terms of comparing it to like a Dallas or a San Antonio or uh, other large uh, bilingual cities. So the approach that we took was uh, to interview bilingual members of the public as well as community leaders and media professionals working here on the South Plains in order to to try to provide a nuanced in-depth portrait of the relationships among language and dialect preference. And that's really where uh, Edoya Lola came in. That's her expertise in linguistics and media use uh, by Latinx populations living on the South Plains. Um, something that I didn't include on the slides but I should point out is all of the research team are Spanish speakers, but quite differently, differently oriented. I learned Spanish as a young adult, non-native speaker, uh, Edoya Lola is a native speaker, 
but from Spain, from the Basque country. And then Gabriel is from Guadalajara. And we decided to have him do the interviews because his version of Spanish was closest to what's spoken here. But with the caveat that, you know, being an academic, right, being a PhD student, he was actually a new, newly minted PhD or just about so when, when he was doing this work. And the fact that he's, you know, coming in as a researcher also leads to some barriers and differences, right? So we're not saying that, you know, there was this complete homophily by any means, but his linguistic variety was closest to the interviewees. And so uh, he conducted the interviews and is very good at it. He, he did interviews for his dissertation research uh, as well. And I, as his advisor, listened in on some of those is, you know, very good, very skilled as a qualitative scholar. So um, this is gonna be a review. I'm sure you all know this, but just uh, some background information that we include in the paper to remind people that Spanish has been spoken in some variety here for centuries, right? And that some of the geopolitical, some of the uh, you know local political shifts have uh, altered the use and some of the attitudes toward language, but that Spanish, uh, you know, English is a later, much later arrival uh, to this region, even though it's the dominant language. Uh, we need to keep that in mind. So since, you know, 1541, when uh, Vasquez de Coronado came into the region uh, starting, and obviously these took a while for these institutions to, to take hold because of the, the geography, um, but, you know, it goes back that far. And then the region under Mexican rule from the 1820s to 48, when the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, basically turned it over to the U.S. Lubbock's Latinx population, about 35%. Uh, but there are some rural uh, counties in, on the South Plains that have 50% uh, plus. And I think that's important to a point that Javier um, was making about, um, you know, sort of who's in the region and who might be most affected by dust storms and some of the health impacts uh, of that. And I think it's also very relevant to the first presentation, right, regarding approaches to veterinary science and how do we, you know, train people being uh, linguistically and culturally sensitive. I'm assuming that's part of the anti-colonial aspect of, of your approach, right? Um, there, I wasn't able to find county uh, countywide uh, or county level information on uh, the prevalence of, of Spanish, but statewide it's uh, 29 and a half uh, percent. So, you know, to us that indicates that, you know, Spanish is important, that there are efforts to, um, to preserve it and and you know uh, keep it moving forward and talk about that um, a little bit more. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention, and I think the the um, top of this is cut off, but because of the uh, because of the zoom. But there's a, a really strong and interesting archive in the Southwest collection uh, here as part of the library system of uh, oral histories of interviews that have been conducted with Hispanic Latinx. Uh, inhabitants of the region, if you will, since the 1970s. And so what I did is I went over and did keyword searches in those that were looking at language, linguistics, you know, maybe language discrimination in some way, uh, education, and also media, and listen to those to see what sorts of patterns or what sort of established, you know, behaviors and attitudes are already there before we're, we're doing this uh, work in, in 2021. And just a few of the key uh, themes that came from that, um, discussions about feeling some isolation from mainstream Anglo society, right? That, that difference in terms of language, in terms of um, culture, uh, probably also some physical attributes or maybe even geographical, we'll talk about that, you know, sort of the distribution of populations within uh, Lubbock uh, here in a bit. Uh, there was discussion of routinized uh, punishments at school for speaking Spanish. People saying we preferred that our kids spoke English because they were getting hit, you know, physically punished at school for speaking Spanish. Um, one of our interviewees, one of the media professionals, said that her father had been suspended from school for four days for speaking Spanish. I mean, that's pretty severe. In some ways, I would rather that my kids suffered the pain of you know, a few minutes of getting hit on their knuckles with a ruler or whatever, rather than being taken out of 
you know, school and ostracized in that way. And that was, you know, as recently as the 70s. So it's not that far back. And there some of that reluctance, some of that concern about the, um, the fallout or the implications of speaking Spanish are, are still with uh, people. Um, it's important to point out, as, as the interviewees did, that church services and community interactions do help uh, maintain uh, connections to Spanish. It's not just within the family, but there are other opportunities to maintain uh, Spanish, and people recognize that and, and, and talked about it. Um, and then uh, also, there, there are some really interesting uh, interviews over there with Ernesto Barton and, and uh, some others who are pioneers in establishing Spanish language media on the South Plains, whether it be broadcasting and radio and then later television, as in Ernesto's uh, example, or like uh, the founder of the El Editor. Uh, so there, there's some good material there in terms of some of the challenges that we're faced, and, and frankly, also some of the help that uh, Hispanic Latinx um, media pioneers got from uh, Anglo English dominant investors, right, who recognize the importance of this and not so much as a, you know, windfall profit investment, but hey, it's important for, um, you know, the Spanish speaking segment of the population to be in, informed as well. So um, some of the goals in our research questions, uh, by exploring the local linguistic repertoires, we investigate how linguistic practices, preferences, and views intersect with media that are used by bilingual individuals, aiming for a better sense of how various dialects, uh, linguistic practices, and media intermingle uh, in a unique region. It's not, you know, this isn't uh, groundbreaking in the sense that nobody's ever thought about it before, but I think what is unique, as I mentioned before, is its application to a specific area. And I'm hoping that this will inspire, and I've been in contact with, you know, people in other parts of the country to do similar work so that we can do some comparison. You know, what are the dynamics in uh, you know, South Florida or in certain areas of Chicago or on the West Coast. Um, uh, we recently had a visitor on campus from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, you know, a state that's seen a dramatic increase in uh, Hispanic Latinx populations. What are the dynamics in an area that haven't have traditionally had that population and, and people have come in uh, more recently? What are some of the local attitudes? How do they feel? Uh, Spanish is, is um, accepted and used, and what are the media, uh, you know, how are the media handling it, if at all? So the uh, research questions, what are the situational bilingual experience and practices among South Plains like Spanish and English uh, speakers of Latinx origin? What Spanish variations are media users aware of? What are the perceived issues and benefits of speaking Spanish in the region? Um, and then how do media portray and reinforce language practices among South Plains bilingual speakers. So um, just some background information on some of the dynamics we saw regarding uh, language use on the, the South Plains. There are diverse varieties of um, Spanish that have been broadly uh, characterized, and this is more, I guess, you know, theoretical or a, or a general um, statement that it can be seen as a foreign language and that is certainly the way it's treated in you know the academy and then um, educational settings uh, we study it as you know something different from an immigrant language and uh, unfortunately this gets you know quite heated in in uh, political environments and then um, a local language in terms of uh, linguistic environments and looking at the variation across them, like I was saying, you know, even as a non-native speaker, being able to note a quite uh, different use of the language here in, in West Texas than in South Texas, and certainly along the border where the code switching is, as far as I'm concerned, a work of art, right? The translanguaging is incredible to me, how people's brains can work that way and how bilinguals can distinguish what area of the border they're from by the way that they uh, that they uh, code switch, right? That there's this localization also, oh, you must be from Del Rio or you must be from El Paso or whatever based on, on how that, that happens. Um, differing amounts of contact with English yield uh, diverse varieties of Spanish influenced by generation in this case, we're talking about the time removed from initial immigrants and 
the, the idea being that there's more distance from Spanish with subsequent generations after the first generation that, that arrives, right? Those latter generations become heritage speakers who engage in uh, translanguaging, you know, more um, bi bilingual or Spanglish, right? Um, the meshing of languages to construct a single message, that's, that's a, a definition of, of translanguaging. Although they communicate successfully um, with their own community, bilinguals generally see themselves as deficient uh, speakers of Spanish. And this was a, an interesting aspect that I had kind of recognized, you know, as somebody who deals with language and media, but hadn't heard people saying it as directly like, you know, hablo pocho, right? Or we, we speak really fractured, choppy Spanish or whatever. It's not, the, it's not the proper Spanish. And part of that might be what I was, the dynamic I was mentioning before about, you know, talking to academic researchers and, um, oh, well, you know, y'all speak that pure Spanish. Well, if you listen to my Spanish, Javier knows this very well. No, you know, it's a, a mix of kind of Norteño with a lot of English, you know, sort of gringo influence. And, um, but this, this notion that there are some types of, of language that are purer than others and that the local variety is often flawed in some way was something that was fairly consistent from the uh, from the interviewees. So the, the basic research method uh, that we employed here, semi-structured interviews with uh, three different groups, the, the bilingual media users, the media professionals, and community leaders. Um, we had about 20 questions. It varied a little bit and we would change the order or you know maybe follow up a little bit differently depending on how the um, how the interview evolved. And then um, these interviews of uh, 40 to 70 minutes. And then the criteria we used that people had to speak Spanish regularly around two or three times a day, uh, be in, uh, fluent in English and then older than 18 and holding US citizenship. Um, that was as much for the incentives as anything else. So uh, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because I don't wanna cut in too much into the discussion time. But we identified three major themes, the language practices and social experiences on the South Plains, uh, language and media for uh, Latinx on the South Plains, and then the uh, media industry and community leader uh, perspectives. So um, this won't be surprising, I don't think, to y'all, but there, we found there are these complex relationships between more recent arrivals who tend to be, um, you know, stronger with the language and more confident with it and those families that have maintained a presence on the South Plains for multiple generations but maybe have a, a more tenuous uh, connection with the language or use it in, in quite specific ways not in a uh, you know in a regular um, basis and um, Spanish use rejected was rejected on some occasions uh, people reported especially among English uh, monolinguals and you know people telling these stories about folks in in public settings telling them to speak English or giving them the stink eye. Uh, I guess a more academic way to say that is a negative gaze, like, you know, looking at them askance for, for speaking uh, Spanish or, or maybe, you know, Spanglish for translanguaging. Um, renouncing or avoiding Spanish language uh, tended to be coupled with other strategies such as moving to white neighborhoods or marrying white spouses by some uh, Latinx to be accepted by the dominant population. And just very quickly, we, we understood there was a sort of imaginary line between more North Lubbock, where um, I guess there's more traditional Hispanic Latinx population base and the growth area to the South. And this notion that uh, folks who moved down there were basically leaving their roots behind or not wanting to be as close to uh, you know, Spanish and, and Latin culture that they were assimilating. That's not our interpretation. That was what we were hearing from some of the, from some of the interviewees, which I found, you know, really interesting that it wasn't just a linguistic issue, but that there was like, if you had a, if you, if you married out of the community, uh, particularly to, you know, a white spouse, that was a, a way that you were trying to insulate from, uh, from the community. Uh, but it was certainly tied in with language as well. Uh, when Latinx are rejected and stigmatized for Spanish, uh, bilingualism perceived as a burden. Um, conversely, uh, an Anglo speaker who uses Spanish is praised as successful. Uh, Javier, you know, could affirm that my Spanish isn't that great, but people do tell me, oh, you, you speak so well. And what I don't hear at the end is for a gringo, 
right? Uh, because there's not that expectation. Cuando empiezo a hablar, están como, ¿qué es eso? Este, este gringo alto habla. ¿Cómo es posible? Right? Because it's it, it's counter to what they're expecting and, um, you know, reading, reading me physically. Um, media professionals and community leaders emphasize economic benefits to bilingualism, especially in relation to uh, the large sought after uh, Latinx youth market. You're probably familiar that since the early 2000s, there's been a whole lot of emphasis on reaching young Latinx populations. Um, it's, you know, it can be dangerous if you don't do it well, but um, having bilingual skills can be a double-edged sword in a job where Spanish is required as native speakers can, can be rather judgmental. So they were saying, hey, you might get paid more for being bilingual, but there's always the risk also that somebody who is a you know, very strong speaker of, of Spanish. Um, in fact, we had a, a quote saying, uh, que prefiero que alguien me atiende que habla muy bien al español. Because if somebody's struggling for a word or if they put the accent in the wrong part or they you know, mix a little English in, um, there can be that judgment and it makes them feel self-conscious. So that economic relationship is really interesting to me. Like how much is it worth getting the extra salary and running the risk of, of um, you know, having, having those kinds of uncomfortable uh, encounters? Um, bilingualism seen as an entryway to multicultural contexts where diverse values are shared, hopefully better understood, uh, an acute awareness of different types of Spanish. Um, I've got some listed there and sensitivity to prestige variations, um, especially uh, Castilian. And um, as I mentioned before, there tend to be a criticism of some of the local variants, uh, sort of talking them down as, as, as not as, as, as pure or uh, accurate. So some see translanguaging as natural, others reject it. Um, this is re reflected in the opinions of some media that employ translanguaging like Tejano radio stations. I've had some really interesting experiences taking, just a, showing a very short clip of bilingual radio in different parts of the Spanish speaking world. Some people just are freaked out. No es posible, como que están destruyendo el idioma, right? Whereas others are like, that's really cool, right? But it seems like the further you get away from areas where that's done, the harder it is for people to sort of accept it as a natural way that language evolves right, for people who are bilingual and creative in their use of, of language. Um, so some of that sort of language purity um, comes, comes into play. Um, so in terms of media, the media plays a critical function complementing uh, linguistic routines and preserving the connection um, with language. Uh, English becomes the default if, if not all family members know Spanish, right? So, you know, trying to decide which, you know, which Netflix series to watch or, you know, where to watch uh, an English network or Univision or Telemundo, um, the default will be English if, if some people are in the, in the family aren't comfortable or, or, you know, proficient, I guess, in, in Spanish. And then, um, you know, familial patterns and dynamics come into play there as well. Subtitles can help audiences follow media narratives and boost their skills um, in communicating uh, correctly as they put it. And this is not something we were digging for, you know, tell us about subtitles. We would just say, you know, what kind of things do you see going on with language when you're sitting down with your family or friends? And a number of people say, oh, I, I really like to put on maybe a Netflix series in Spanish or watch Spanish language television, but with the, the captioning or with subtitles to be able to uh, make that connection between what they're hearing and, and the language to maintain their skills. Um, Regarding representation, the interviews, interviewees made clear distinctions among the mainstream and Spanish language media, English media tending to focus more on po poverty, crime, and immigration stories, while uh, Spanish uh, language media offer broader, uh, more balanced portrayals. And there is some research that affirms this. This is what the interviewees are telling us, but the literature basically says that, yes, that's, that's true in terms of the way the same story tends to be reported by either uh, Spanish or, or English language news. Interviewees recognize greater opportunities for Latinx to work in the mainstream media, but did not feel uh, represented by uh, Latinx talent working in the media, noting that Spanish language media tends to prefer uh, lighter skinned people, not darker ones like themselves. And they would say, oh, no, they don't look like us, 
right? They're Latinos, they speak Spanish, but they tend to be much lighter skinned. And so there was this distinction in, in perception of sort of who was represented there and inferring that there were fewer opportunities for darker complected uh, Latinos to be able to be in the, in the Spanish language media. And then um, this issue of employing a, a standardized uh, Spanish that didn't seem to originate uh, from anywhere, sort of the, the neutral Spanish. And that's what broadcast of Spanish has tried to achieve, right? Not make it too uh, clearly identifiable being from one country. Um, you know, a lot of the dubbing work uh, early on anyway, it was done in Mexico. So there's a uh, I guess a more standardized Mexican broadcast Spanish, um, but the, there was a recognition of, of that element. I'm going to uh, jump ahead to the uh, conclusions just so um, we can save some time and, and, and talk a little bit here. Um, Latinx has continued to face social pressures from dominant cultures, uh, racial linguistic ideologies, and maintain notions of prestige languages and hegemonic varieties uh, that are still closely connected to. Uh, Spanish media in the US, but there's also a sense of resistance through language, cultural retention and maintenance in the form of social activism, uh, like in teaching uh, Spanish to Latinx children and not saying just in you know, schools, but also at, at home and in, in communities, uh, trying to maintain the, the language as a way of cultural um, reinforcement and preservation. Spanglish has become a tool of resistance in the South Plains context um, where the role of the media is invaluable and local media should become more sensitive to the nuances and value of the Spanish dialect spoken in the South Plains, uh, looking for ways to uh, integrate and uh, promote it. So those are just a few of our um, conclusions uh, based on this work. And uh, thank you very much. So um, I think what we will do now is first look and see if we have any questions uh, from Zoom and in the chat. Let's see. I see a comment from uh, Cam. Fantastic uh, session, everyone. He had to leave. Uh, took away several things from your presentations. Ideas will be beneficial to me in the future. Uh, I should mention that Dr. Stone, he's, he's faculty here in our college, is uh, like me in the sense of, of uh, being an Anglo who's learning uh, Spanish as an adult and really being, you know, I was committed to it. It was a heavy teaching load, but still picking up a lot of Spanish. Um, so I'll encourage folks uh, online. Uh, we seem to be having some audio issues here, but if you will post any questions or comments that you have in the chat, we'll, we'll try to pick them up. But let's, let's open it to some discussion here in the, in the room. What questions do you all have? I think that came up here in like 2011 uh, from South Texas. And one of the dichotomies that we realized that some of the was that we went, there was a time when we went and asked for a specific person, Dr. Lassiter. So we asked for this person, I believe it was Ms. Martinez, right? So we we're asking the front office person, we'd like to speak to Ms. Martinez about whatever the issue was in the phone. And we just get a really blank stare back at us, right? And we're like, yes, Ms. Martinez, she's, uh, she works here, so, uh, she's a teacher here, I believe it might have been the situation. And they start scrolling through their database. And I said, well, I see a Ms. Martinez here. And it was like, yeah, it's Teresa Martin, it's Teresa Martinez. That's who he's talking about. Yeah, I'll get her for you. Perfect. And so in our in our discussion, and it kind of on the ride back, trying to figure out what was all that about. Initially, our preconception was, wow, so they're losing people are losing their Spanish. Out, and this is the periphery of outside of Lubbock, kind of kind of in the north northern areas. But as we were embedded here a little bit longer in Lubbock, we came to find out. There was a lot of prejudice growing up with the families that, that worked in these areas, like migrant families that worked here and ended up staying here. They, you talked about corporal punishment, you talked about suspensions, mm -hmm. and they endured, or, or they saw uh, colleagues endure. And so when they had their kids, and their kids were, they they discouraged the use of Spanish. But and maybe even ang anglicized their their last name. And, and just by default, it just became that way, and it was accepted. Mm -hmm. There was no there was no looking down on it, even from the parents of the families that were heavily set Hispanic. Mm. But when it, 
the so the speaking with these folks with with, with the that, that that generation there, there's not a lot. Of, they don't know a lot of Spanish, and there's there's really not a whole lot of interest in learning about it because it's really not part of their history. Their history is here. They're they're they're, they're accustomed here. Now they become more ingrained about hey, let me talk to mom and dad a little more about their history. Wow, there's then maybe there's an interest. But the dichotomy was when I when we spoke to the families, the older generation. They appreciate Spanish. Like mm. they all, all of a sudden, wow, you understand it, Mito, habla, habla más conmigo. And they, they engage you more about speak to me in our language. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so different because they can't have that same conversation with their child because right. it's lost. It's lost. Her. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that came out in, in the discussions also was that that tension can be a, a source of, of guilt or apprehension by parents because on the one hand, they want their their you know kids to be socialized and fit in really well, but on the other hand, you know if you got you know parents or grandparents who are Spanish dominant and really prefer Spanish, then they're you know creating this sort of barrier between the generations by encouraging um, encouraging kids to be um, you know to use English. And I have a former colleague, you know, who was here at the university, but but left a number of years ago, who said that his his parents were very clear about not wanting their kids to speak Spanish because they saw English as the language of money and opportunity, and you know, bright kids. Um, but I, I think it would be really difficult to make a, a a strong argument that being bilingual would have hurt, you know, their opportunity in in English, you know, to to succeed in the English world by knowing knowing some Spanish, and that's. That's kind of a common thing, like, oh, if kids are learning English, uh, Spanish, or another language, then they're not going to be as good in math, chemistry, whatever. Bullshit. I mean, some of you are education experts, and you know better than I do, but it actually enhances further down the road. That's the brain. And, and that's yeah. the outside is is look at the schools here and here and, and love it. Dual languages is all over the place now. The, the programs are there, the schools are there now. And they're not just Hispanic kids that are there. They're, you look and walk in the classroom, mm -hmm. and there's you know little you know, five, six, seven year old girls, kids that are toe headed mm -hmm. and blonde and speaking great Spanish. Right, and an so immersion program. Different people yeah. are understanding the benefits of, and they're, sure. they're so now learning Spanish, speaking Spanish in the classroom is now applauded and not punished, which is interesting now. Yeah, you know, twenty years later, yeah, or thirty years. You talk about it, it's the 70s, 80s. Definitely, I think Arlene, and then we had a comment back here. Um, so I just wanted to comment. I've had two different experiences um, in my personal life and my professional life. So my personal life, because I was born in Mexico, but I was raised in the U.S., mm. um, I don't have an accent per se, mm. but when I used to go to Mexico when I was young, I was criticized and looked down upon because Puta. I didn't speak proficient Spanish mm -hmm. and it was a little bit choppy here mm -hmm. and there, but there were certain words that I didn't know how to translate. Mm -hmm. um, and so something important is that in, in Mexico, where I'm from anyway, there are three types of Spanish. There's lower class, there's middle class, and there's high class. Mm -hmm. So if you live in Mexico and you fall in the low or middle class, you're looked down upon from the upper, you know, the upper class because you don't speak well, because you're not educated, because whatever. Right. Um, so here in the US, for me to communicate with so a lot of my work revolves around um, closing the gap in communication between our agricultural workers and um, our animal science professionals and veterinarians. Mm. And so when I try and communicate with the Hispanic workforce, um, if I use terminology that's too advanced or too academic, they won't open up. Mm. And so I, when I do this research, I typically don't go in saying, oh, I'm Dr. Garcia and blah, 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 blah. Right. I try and be one of the workers so that I can fit in mm. and so that they are able to communicate with me. And so knowing that I do, most of these workers are I-9 immigrants, you know, so they come with, with permits and stuff like that mm -hmm. to work in agriculture. Um, and they're they're very um, well-versed, right, in Spanish. So they know a lot of terminology, but we fail to understand that Spanish is not the same in every location. Right. So Mexicans speak differently from people that are from Honduras from El Salvador, sure. um, and we try and use that same terminology, and that creates a barrier um, in communication. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Is it Howard? Howard yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, uh, also, uh, from my uh, personal experiences, when I uh, migrated from Puerto Rico to Central Florida in Orlando, 
I, uh, I went through the process of documenting my process of adapting to the community. And mm. some of the comments I mentioned there, I leave them, but in a different way or variation of them. Mm. I really remember this having where to live in Orlando, whether it's in the North part, North America, mm. or the South part, see what is more Latin. And <clears throat> I did a study uh, uh, after my dissertation on uh, the migration process. It was related to my dissertation, but after my dissertation. And I found out that there is a continuum between adaptation and acculturation. And people, and, and it's not clearly defined by ethnicity or social class or anything. It's more mostly like a, an individual decision. And, and people were deciding whether to live in the more Americanized part or the more Latin part based on, on the personal criteria. But I went through that. I remember going through that. Uh, some of the things that I found in the literature is that people who, there are people who definitely do not want to lose their culture, their language, and their, uh, that's the way to <clears throat> reassert their identity, their cultural identity. So even when they come to the United States, they learn English, they speak English, but they keep as much as they can that culture. There are others that realize that they want to <clears throat> get the opportunity to integrate more into the, uh, into the new culture, and they, they're gonna, even though they keep their, uh, uh, they speak Spanish at home and, and they keep the culture, they want to integrate. And, and that's part of the whole continuum. So when I was in Orlando back in the 90s, <clears throat> we had to decide where to put my daughter in school. She was starting kindergarten. And we had a, a very, we have to take a very smart decision, a very crush decision, because at the time, the program in public school was, if you're, if you're Latino, you're going to be sidetracked into a Spanish-only school program. No chances for English integration or integrating with the first of the, of, the, of the school population. And that's not what I want to put my daughter. <clears throat> so you want a deep immersion in English. Right. Yeah. Because <clears throat> not only we are American or Puerto Rican, right? But we are, she was going to integrate to the culture in the, in the United States. Thank you for sharing. So we wanted her that that education helped her integrate into the culture and society. Still, she's a very good uh, Spanish speaker. She knows the culture of Puerto Rico. But uh, at the time, that was that, that, that dichotomy. Do we put her on the Spanish only track? Or do we uh, put her on the English track and we keep teaching her Spanish at home? Now that issue uh, in Orlando and in Florida was years ago, but 30 years ago, that was a big, a big decision. Yeah. We, my family had the, kind of the opposite. We lived in Monterrey, New Orleans for three years when I was at the Tech in Monterrey. And we first had our kids in some bilingual private schools, but we realized they don't need any English instruction. So we pulled them out of there and put them in the public kingdom. And it was tough for them at first because they didn't really know any Spanish, but you know, within, three or four months, they were, you know, very confident making all, you know, friends and play dates and, and all this, because we're like, they're hearing English from us all the time. They don't need to be hearing it uh, at school. I think there may be a class coming in here, but I had a very quick question for the, the first presentation. Um, and I was wondering, like, what is, do you see some basic differences in sort of how um, uh, Latinx populations relate to animals in general and you know veterinary science i mean is, are there cultural differences to to speak of that you need to keep in mind in terms of uh you know developing a syllabus and an approach to education in that field um so um so i guess it's important to understand that the hispanic culture um you know, froze up differently than than the you know Anglo-Saxon or whatever you want to call it. Um, so we did a study, or one of my one of my collaborators collaborators did a study um, at a pig facility, and the question was to all workers, the Hispanics and and, and other um, cultures, what do you keep your dogs indoors or outdoors? Most Hispanic workers keep their dogs outdoors. Why? Because that's the culture. Animals are meant to be outside. Whereas the American culture, right, keeps their pets inside. And so for veterinarians, 
um, especially you know in this curriculum, it's important to understand what the community is like. Who, who are you serving, and what are the, what is their culture like? To understand how to treat their animals. So more than likely, an animal that is raised indoors, right, or is indoors all the time, is probably not going to be exposed to a lot of the diseases that the animals that are raised outdoors experience. Um, so it's so important to understand culture and and how these animals are raised based on those cultures and their beliefs. With that, just a question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So just yeah. Uh, some of the dangerous stereotypical assumptions from that. Just that, for example, that they don't care about the animals. Uh, the other one might be that uh, they're not as important. Uh, and then the other, the other aspect of that is, is the fact that a lot of people in different fields have infiltrated probably to an extent that they behave more like the annual community and they, they, they keep their dogs in the So there are differences even within the community. So if you make an assumption based on it is what down here, so it must be that they keep their dogs out of the world. Well, there's there's another very brand new society within Latinx and Hispanic that just behave and sound very, very traditional white uh, uh, American. So, so like pet, pet treatment, you know, as a as a marker of, of a culture in a way, yeah, or or uh, cultural affinity. Well, thank you all uh, very much for this this panel, and please do encourage you know folks in, in subsequent years to submit and present. We need to you know not only have great presentations like I think we had today. And thank you very much, Javier, for you know stepping in as a master student and uh, and great job. I have a question for you. We'll talk about it later. Um, but um, thank you all very much. We're going to move this next door. Uh, for the next panel in uh, 268. Thank you.